All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for attending Post University's Blackboard Workshop. Uh, my name is Alan Kingsley. Uh, I will be your host tonight. I am one of the graduate academic success counselors here in the office. Uh, I'm covering one half of the MBA and most of the business certificate students uh, fall under me as well. So you may know me, you may not, but um, I am excited to talk with you all tonight and to go over uh, some of the basics of navigating our systems, uh, give you some tips, tricks, and everything else that you will hopefully need to, uh, to be successful in the program. Now, we are recording this tonight, so if you are on video, please know that your video is going to be recorded as well. It's going to go up on the university YouTube page. Uh, please also be aware of your microphones, um, any background noise or anything like that. We'd appreciate it if you can go on mute. Uh, <laughs> I should mention uh, I have a cranky toddler in the other room uh, and a saintly wife who is watching her. She should be going to bed soon, but if you hear her in the background, I apologize in advance. Uh, but okay, let's get started here. Oh. All right, so let's get this underway. So first and foremost, I want to talk a little bit about our agenda tonight. We're going to talk about navigating Blackboard, uh, which is, of course, how you get into your classes, how you do things here. Uh, go over the basics of posting on the discussion board, uh, posting an assignment uh, into class. We're going to talk a little bit about APA writing style. Uh, which is required in all courses at the university. Uh, we're not going to dig deep. We definitely have resources for that, but we're going to go over a little bit of APA. And we're going to have a Q&A session. We're not doing the breakout rooms since this is a smaller group. Right. So let's start with navigating Blackboard. Now, we do have, um, we normally have a screen share option and we're having some technical issues with that. So instead, I'm going to be working today off of screenshots, but I think that uh, uh, Dave, my director who was in here a little bit ago, did a pretty good job of giving us an idea of exactly what this looks like. Now, when you first log into your classes, you're going to see a screen that looks something like what you see in front of you. It's got a purple stripe down the left and the main page in the middle there. One of the best first things you can do in your class, and if you haven't done this yet, we're in week three right now, but if you haven't done this yet, go into course information. It's one of the top links on the left hand side, and that's going to give you everything you need to know as you're getting started in your course. Like for many courses, there's a course introduction video. But it's also going to talk about just a general description, kind of an elevator pitch, you know, in 90 seconds, what's this class about? And it's going to give you course outcomes. The course outcomes are actually something that we use with our um, with our accrediting body to make sure that our classes are up to educational standards. And this is being very specific about exactly what people are going to be learning to getting out of this class. Okay, course information is also where you're going to find a class syllabus. And the syllabus has everything you need to know about the course kind of in long form. It's going to give you uh, rubrics for assignments, course guidelines, anything the instructor or the program chair wants you to know. All of that's going to be in the syllabus. It's always the first thing you should be looking at in your class because it's really going to kind of break down policies, processes, the things you ought to know. Um, our professors are usually pretty good about posting announcements. They're going to go over a lot of that as well. but. The course syllabus is something that's been vetted by the department, by the faculty senate. It's gone through all the right steps to make sure that everything looks the way it ought to look. So I always recommend going to the course syllabus first and foremost. Um, also, I apologize. I have two monitors, so if you see me looking off to the side, I'm looking at my second monitor. But um, also in the course course information tab, you're going to see a breakdown of your assignments, exactly how everything is weighted in this class, because not everything is going to be weighted equally in all your classes. You know, everything, your discussion board for the week and your assignment for the week might both be out of 100 points, but they're not actually equally weighted. You know, all of your discussion boards, eight weeks of discussion boards may equal to 40% in the class uh, or 30% as the example here shows. But 
the journals in this course are worth 20. The interact interactives and quizzes are worth 20, and that's total out of everything. So knowing exactly what are the quote unquote important assignments and which ones are going to matter a little less in the overall numbers can be an important part of managing your time effectively. Now there is also an ask the instructor thread. Um, some pieces of course information have a link directly to ask the instructor. You can also find it in your discussion boards, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But reaching out to your instructor is one of the very best things that you can do, keeping the lines of communication open. You know, it's very common to be unsure if you really want to talk with your teacher, if you want to, you know, admit that you don't understand something, assuming everybody else gets it, or you know, feeling like, well, maybe if I just read it five or six more times, something will click. Many times, the easiest thing to do is just to ask. <laughs> and your instructors should all have office hours where you can, and many times you'll be able to actually call them or schedule kind of a Skype session or something like that. Um, you can email them personally. You can also use the Ask the Instructor thread on the discussion board. Um, that is public, so I wouldn't discuss grades or anything too personal on there. I, that's a better conversation to have via email or on the phone. But ask the instructor is is really important. You know, maybe they can help you, maybe they can't. You know, even if it's something like I need extra time for my assignment, um, I need to. I have a business trip I didn't expect. I got orders from my commanding officer. Uh, I, yeah, I, I had a death in the family, um, or even just. You know, I was at my son's basketball game last night and it went into overtime and I didn't get home until 1130 and I just couldn't get it done. Can I have a little bit of extra time? So maybe they say yes, maybe they say no. They definitely can't say anything if you don't tell them what happened. So I'm a big, big fan of just develop a relationship with your instructor, ask questions. And if you're a little uncertain, ask your academic success counselor to reach out for you. Uh, we may not do it every single time. We're going to want you guys to talk directly eventually. But we can help establish a you know a point of communication. If you reach out and don't hear back, you can talk to us. But your instructors, they're your subject matter experts here. You know, they're going to be the people who are the best or in the best position to help you out to answer your questions and especially to make judgments about what's going on in your class. So look for the ask the instructor thread again. Sometimes available in course information, always on their on your discussion board. Okay, there is also a water cooler. That will uh, so sort of it's, it's a place where students can talk about things not related to the assignment. Um, you'll find various uses for that in the class, but if you're looking to to uh, engage with some of your colleagues and other things, that can be a nice place to uh, to, to start that conversation. But you know, I'm going to get into that a little bit later, um, along with the resources that it mentions here. So. Uh, any questions on course information or anything that I mentioned so far? No. Understood. Great. I understand. It. Very good. All right. So let's move on to college success resources. All right. This may take on a couple of different names, but in your class, often down that left hand side, you're going to have that purple. Uh, the, the purple stripe. It's going to list the different units in your class uh, and many times in the grad program. We do have some classes that look a little differently. They've all got that purple stripe though. Um, if you go down in many places, you're going to find a link to college success resources. That is an easy way to get to our library, which you're going to be using uh, extensively <laughs> over the course of the program, uh, no matter what program you're in. And Resources for you know for source evaluation. If you need to check and see, is this a is this a uh, is this going to be a scholarly resource? Is this a resource my teacher will accept? Under college success resources, you're going to find links to that. They've also got some tips on writing an academic paper. Often coming up to um, to a college level, especially if you have been out of school for a while, can be an adjustment. And I'll touch on this more in a little bit, but the way that we write in our day to day life doesn't tend to be the way that you're going to want to write in your classes to your instructor, to your classmates. Um, you know, there, there's something called an academic voice. And. Getting some tips on that, 
you'll find in that college success resources area. It's also something we have a center for academic success. They're really wonderful in this area of just kind of helping you find that academic voice and making sure you're writing in it. Like, in like okay. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. My dog just listening. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. Okay. That's all right. Um, okay. Now, in addition, in these in this resource area, you're going to find links to a lot of the things that you'll be using in many of your papers and a lot of your research. Um, and just sort of as places to check yourself, All right? We do have open access journals. Uh, open access journals, essentially, this is an online directory that is going to give you access to dozens and dozens and dozens of peer reviewed journals. You know, these are considered academic works. These have sort of been through, uh, they've been vetted and re-vetted and often, you're going to find that the resources that you can find through our open access journals are going to give you a lot better information, a lot more scholarly information, a lot of information that is more going to be more directly applicable to what you're writing about. Especially if you're trying, if you're doing something in one of your higher level classes, your 600 level classes, your capstones, uh, a lot of these things are going to be useful to you, making sure that you have resources that are trustworthy. There are links to APA resources, some APA help online. You can find through here as well. And APA, again, I'll talk about it in more detail a little later, but APA is one of these things that has no magic bullet to it. You've just kind of kind of learn the formula and do it enough time so it becomes second nature. But these resources are here to help in the meantime to make sure that you are doing everything correctly. If you need help creating a uh, a, uh, a reference page, you know, formatting your resources correctly. There is bibliographic software. There are resources for you for many of your assignments, links to the discussion board. So also some information on academic integrity. Academic integrity essentially is a nice way of talking about plagiarism. Um, that's something that the university takes very, very seriously. We want to make sure that you are doing your own work and submitting your own work, but also giving credit to other people when you're using their work. And that's something that um, any one of us in the academic success office is happy to talk with you about, or we do have an academic integrity officer, Stephanie Dion, who is always happy to talk with people about that if they are, if they need some clarification or they have some confusion. Your instructor as well should be well versed on academic integrity and university plagiarism policies. So if you're ever not quite sure if you're doing, doing the right thing or you're putting this together the right way, ask questions, always ask. But you can find some of the, these things yourself in the College Success Resources tab, along with with everything else that I talked about above. You know what? It looks like. Give me just one moment. It looks like there are some people waiting in the lobby here. Let me get let them in. All right. There we go. All right. Now, some other resources that are available directly through Blackboard. Again, on that left-hand menu in that purple stripe, you're going to find links to TutorMe, to Grammarly, an academic writer, um, APA writing style tools, and a few other things as well, uh, depending on your class. Now, TutorMe, this is one of the sources that we work with. There's a third-party service. Uh, we have on campus something called the Center for Academic Success, and you can set up times to uh, engage with a tutor through there. Uh, they're located directly on campus. If you are local to Connecticut, you can actually come online or come on campus rather, excuse me, go into the office and meet with somebody. But they work with our online students as well every day. Tutor Me, though, is a third party service that kind of fills in a lot of those cracks. Uh, they are 24 7 online tutoring support. Uh, Tutor Me is a fantastic service that you're already paying for. This is part of your tuition. Um, so if it's two in the morning and you just cannot figure out how this is supposed to work, then you can log into Tutor Me. They're going to connect you with somebody who's an expert in the field, and you two can talk it out. You know, they're not going to do your homework for you, 
but they will make sure that they get they, they'll be able to help you get those concepts across and understand where it is you're running up against blocks even if you're in a program that has mathier courses they have a virtual whiteboard where you can go and sort of write your problems up on the whiteboard and they will work with you figuring that stuff out uh tutor me is a really excellent resource you get 10 free hours per term so every term you're going to get 10 hours to log into tutor me and talk to someone for a lot of students 10 hours is plenty if you need more go talk to your academic success counselor whether that's me or emily castle or wendy zulo you know there are several of us in there come talk to us and we can always get you more time that's usually not a problem uh, but tutor me is something that is a said it's been a lifesaver for many of my students grammarly may be something that you are already familiar with um, depending how often you're online you may see ads you may see little youtube commercials and things like this uh, grammarly is a pay service that you get access to as a post student uh, for free so if you're already but not for free but as a part of your tuition so if you are paying for grammarly already you don't need that as long as you're a student at post grammarly is kind of like microsoft word spell checker on steroids um, it is going to be your best friend it's certainly my best friend i use it every day <laughs> and so does everybody else on my team and so does probably your teacher uh, grammarly is something is an application that you can set up to work with you within microsoft word you can set it up to work on google chrome or whatever your web browser is um, i believe there's even an application to set it up on your phone but Grammarly is going to monitor your spelling, monitor the way that you're writing, and it's going to give you hints and tips. It's going to notice when you've misspelled something, but it's also going to notice if you are, um, maybe you've used the same word four times in a paragraph. It's going to point that out. Or if you're being overly wordy in your sentence, if there's a shorter way to say the thing that you're trying to say, Grammarly is going to point it out to you. Uh, it's an excellent resource. and just because Grammarly points something out doesn't mean that it's the only thing. You know, it doesn't mean you have to take their suggestion. You know, I don't always. Sometimes I think their grammar can be a little uh, a little overtuned. But if they're pointing something out to me that like, hey, maybe you should change this, it does tell me that maybe I need to take a second look at that sentence. Is that maybe I don't want to do what Grammarly is telling me to do, but maybe I need to take a second look and make sure that I'm actually being as open and straightforward as I think I am. Uh, it's a wonderful resource. And again, the whole time you're a post student, you will have access to Grammarly Premium and uh, you will be very thankful for it. I promise you that. Now, Academic Writer, they haven't actually linked uh, uh, lumped in there with Grammarly. Academic Writer is a resource that used to be known as APA Style Central. I've mentioned APA a couple of times, and I'm going to mention it a couple of times more, but that's because it really is very important. Um, if you aren't sure how to cite something in your paper, um, how to do an in-text citation or a, uh, you know, or uh, an end note or anything, you know, how to quickly format the top of your paper, how to put in page numbers in the right in the right style, um, Academic Writer is going to be it's going to be able to help make that happen. And you'll find that all under the Academic Writer tab or the APA or link, rather, or the APA link on that left hand side. Um, yeah. Again, this is one of those things where a, uh, APA, I, I didn't stop to define APA. APA is um, stands for American Psychological Association. It's a way of citing your resources, your references. Whenever you've looked something up in a book, whenever you've taken out a quote, or even just taken someone else's thoughts or ideas and paraphrased them, you know, just gave it your own spin. But you're really the source of where that came from. It didn't come from your brain. It came from this website. It came from this journal. You want to make sure you're giving them credit. So APA is our way of doing that. Uh, it's one of the most recognized citation sources in the world, uh, styles in the world. And um, as I said before, everything you're going to do at post is going to require APA. So that's why I keep bringing it up. It is important. Uh, if you're not following APA, then technically this is considered plagiarism. You know, it just it, and to be blunt about it, just because you didn't know doesn't mean you're not responsible for it. So knowing it is important. Um, so these tools can be a real lifesaver. They can help teach you and 
they can help make sure that you are avoiding some of the pitfalls. And as I said earlier, we're all happy to help with that stuff. But if you want a quick check on something, that APA link on your left hand side in your classroom can be a real help there. All right. I'm jumping outside of your regular Blackboard classroom right now. Um, this is a close up in your landing page. When you first log into Blackboard, you're going to find a, um, a list of all your classes directly in the center of the page and a couple of things on the left and right. But there is a section called Student Services at the top. Uh, just the same way that there's that purple stripe down the left, there's a purple stripe across the top of your screen when you first log into Blackboard, and you're going to find Student Services on that link. One of the things at the very top of Student Services is our Center for Academic Success. I've mentioned them before. They are basically our in-house tutoring uh, crew. Uh, and they work with, again, they work with professional tutors. They also work with peer educators who are other students who have already gone through this program or have gone through the classes that you're having trouble with. And, you know, we vetted them, we trust them. Um, the Center for Academic Success is, again, something you're getting as part of your tuition here. They can help you uh, wrapping your hands around concepts or understanding, you know, understanding certain material. They can help you with brainstorming or writing an outline for a paper or, uh, you know, they have. Well, as it says, you know, they have a lot of different subjects that they are experts in. And for the stuff that they don't have experts immediately on hand, we have Tutor Me as well. Both of the links for both the Center for Academic Success, we also we call it the CAS, for, for both the CAS and for Tutor Me are available under that Student Services tab. It'll be right at the top of the page once you click it. Tutor Me. Um, in addition to simply helping you study, giving you tutoring, they also offer a writing lab. And the writing lab is fantastic. If you've got a paper that's due on Sunday and you can finish it up by Friday, you can submit something to the writing lab under tutor me. You send them your paper. You say, I need to make sure that, you know, did I hit all of these points the way I think I did? Or I'm terrible in APA format. Did I do this right? Or I, I think I write, you know, I think I use commas way too much. Or I know I'm bad with run-on sentences. Or am I using a, a scholarly voice? Or I, I don't think I am using, a, a, you know, a, uh, an academic voice. How do I do that better? Or simply, does this paper make sense? <laughs> Let them know what you want. You can submit it to the writing lab, and they will get it back to you in under 12 hours with feedback. Uh, they are, again, this is the kind of thing that can be a real lifesaver. It requires a bit of time management because you need to make sure that you are giving yourself time to get it back before the submission is due. But uh, the people at Tutor Me are really excellent and just kind of helping you polish your paper and making sure that you are, you're giving your professor what you think you're giving them. Uh, I, I strongly, strongly encourage you to reach out to any and all of these services or if you need, you know, to you need some help making sure you connect with them, again, talk to your ASC, and we will make sure that you get in touch with the people who can help you. Uh, I know that was a whole bunch of information. Any questions on any of that on the CAS, on Tutor Me, on the Writing Lab, or any of the services I mentioned on the prior slide? It's understood. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. OK, so let's jump back into your class. Let's talk about discussion boards. This is something that if you're not comfortable with it yet, you will get comfortable <laughs> with it very quickly because yeah. <laughs> you're going to be doing this a lot. OK. Uh, now, the screenshots here are not from a grad class. They are from one of our undergrad classes, but it's the same. Um, your discussions, typically, you're going to have at least one a week at the grad level. Often there can be two or three in a week. And you are going to be jumping in and you're going to be either creating threads or responding to threads, depending on how your classes are set up. Now, on the left hand side in that purple stripe, there should be a link to the discussions. That is going to take you to, um, to a page that looks a little similar to what you see in front of you. Within each of your unit folders, you're also usually going to find a link to the discussions. Um, in classes that are set up in this format, and again, not all of them are, but many of them are, 
there is almost always going to be some kind of discussion board. So if you don't see it in the unit folder, check in the discussion link as well, just to be sure. Now, when you are making discussion posts, what they have an example of here is one way to do it. There will be a create thread button towards the top. They're in that orange circle, and that's going to open up a completely blank area for you to type your title and your information and whatever it is that you want to say to the class. However, you're going to be responding to your classmates. Uh, it's going to look a little bit like that. All right, it's going to give you the question up top in that first red box. It's you can give yourself a title uh, and often that can just be unit one DB, for example, or it can be your name or it can be whatever you feel like is a relevant title and you type what you want to say in the message. Now, many times, uh, certainly in my classes, I encourage my students to do this. I don't type directly in this discussion box. Uh, if I lose it for whatever reason, if something something happens to Blackboard or something happens to my computer or I, you know, I, I spill my coffee on the keyboard, I don't <laughs> want to lose everything. <laughs> so I will type everything out in a Word document because mm -hmm. Word auto saves, which Blackboard does not. And so it gives me plenty of time to to type, to, to make corrections, to do whatever it is that I need to do to make sure that what I've written out looks perfect. And then you can copy and paste the whole thing into that message box. Um, I find that's uh, that's prevented heartache on more than one occasion. Uh, and I've also not done it on more than one occasion and suddenly realized I lost 45 minutes worth of work. <laughs> you don't want to be that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So some of the classes, again, depending on your program, depending on what the school of thought is uh, in the, the, you know, the Baldry School versus the Burke School versus, you know, depending on how your, your professors and your program chairs and your deans think about these things, you may actually not have that option to create a thread. What you may see instead, you have all those links to test, 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 test. Um, again, that's just where they took the screenshot from, but you may see a pre-existing thread there from your your professor. Some of our classes are going to do what they call nested discussions, and I don't think that there we have a screenshot for this exactly, but the professor is going to write out the question for the week, and then you and all of your classes, your classmates, are simply going to be responding to that. The um, you know, you'll have something that looks a little similar to this, although not quite. Um, everything you're going to do is nested in that same uh, you know, in that same discussion thread. So by Friday, it's going to look like a novel um, because all of your classmates are going to be in there and talking and responding to each other. Uh, that's done intentionally in some of the programs. I know a lot of our MBA classes have discussions that are done this way. Um, the, 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 the prevailing theory in there is that essentially you're going to need to go in and make sure you're reading. You're reading what the professor's saying. You're reading what your classmates are saying. You really have to kind of get into it and understand it so you know when and where you want to make your responses. Um, the, you know, the, the, the thought is that it's going to make sure that, the, that you as a student are, are reading and engaging more, that you can't just skip all the stuff that you don't want to read because it's all contained within that same discussion thread. Uh, some people really like that. I know professors seem to really like it. Not every student does, but it is the way that some of the classes are formatted. So you may not have that create thread option. It's going to jump to something that looks much closer to what you're seeing on this screen right here, um, where you're just going to be putting in your response and posting, and it will show up within that larger thread. Now, a couple of general tips for good discussion board posts. First and foremost, speak academically. I mentioned this earlier, the academic voice. Uh, the opposite of the academic voice is conversational writing. Many of us, and it, right now in 2022, we type, we write more than probably anybody at any other point in history. We type things out all the time because we've all got a Facebook or we've all got an Instagram or we've all got a whatever. You know, we're online constantly, and so we're always typing things. But by default, most of us write the way we speak. And there's nothing wrong with that in most settings. Uh, 
even in this, there's not necessarily anything wrong with it per se. You know, writing the way you speak is just fine. But the same way you don't talk to your boss, the way the same way you talk to your friends, you don't want to write in a classroom where you are representing yourself as an educational, you know, as, as an educational professional. The same way that you would write something out on Facebook. So you want to look for ways that you can write in a way that sounds a little more formal. That's going to give you. Um, it doesn't mean you use the biggest word in the thesaurus. You know that that isn't the intent of it. But often you want to avoid contractions. For example, instead of can't, you say cannot. Instead of didn't, you say did not. Yeah, you know, it sounds like a small thing, but it makes you sound a little more formal. You want to uh, avoid using. Um, uh, my vocabulary is failing me. I apologize, but. Uh, Instead of using uh, words like FBI, I think Federal Bureau of Investigation, you know, things like that can, or NBA, National Basketball Association, spelling out words rather than using their, their, their uh, man, words are just hard tonight for me. But uh, I, I think you, you get what I'm saying. Spelling things out is going to, again, it just, it sounds a little better. It sounds a little more formal. Um, Often avoiding speaking in the third person or in the first person, excuse me, instead of I think, I wish, I believe. Sometimes that is fine, but often cutting those I feel statements or I think can help you sound more authoritative, more formal, more informed. Um, it, it provides a different tone. Oh. There's some really good information on how to speak with an academic voice, and, and that's something that um, the cast can help you with our Center for Academic Success. Your advisor may be able to help you out. I know uh, I have several documents that I can send to people who are interested on how to write in an academic voice. It's also, honestly, it's the kind of thing you can look that up on YouTube as well. You can look it up on YouTube, you can throw it into Google, and there's a lot of good information on there. But just being cognizant of how you sound, how you come across, uh, can can matter a lot. You know, we don't have a classroom. You, you're not going to look someone in the eye. You're not going to shake their hand. You're not going to get that body language or the tone. Instead, you have what you write, and you're going to come across in you know in, in your words. So you want to make sure you're choosing them carefully. Um, critical thinking. Again, avoiding opinion and emotion unless prompted. A lot of what you're going to be doing is going to be based on facts and research. You know that that sort of that that appeal to logic is always going to be your best route in a conversation because feelings change, opinions change, and no one has no one has a wrong feeling. If you take my meaning, you know everyone's entitled to the way they feel about something, but when you're talking about Many of the topics you're going to be going over in your programs, feelings aren't going to matter as much as, you know, what does the research say? What did the author say? What does the, what conclusions did you draw and why? And if the conclusion is, I like the way that one sounded, that isn't, that's not going to stand up to very much scrutiny. So you always want to figure out the why of what you're saying, why you feel the way you do. And that's going to not just help you express yourself better, but it's going to give your classmates something to respond to. You know, it's really going to give them, it's going to give them a foothold to actually prompt a conversation. Uh, citations, especially at the grad level, discussion boards often are going to come with citation requirements. They want to make sure that you are, again, you're not just shooting from the hip. You've done the reading, you know, exactly what points you want to make and where you can point someone to if they want to look at more. So citations can be huge and just grounding what you're saying in facts. Uh, when replying to your classmates, thoughtful responses are helpful. Um, what is a non thoughtful response? I agree. Great point. That's not a good discussion board post. Mm. Um, it can be the start of an OK discussion board post. But you're going to want to figure. Every post you make, you want to make sure that you are adding to the discussion. 
you know, what are you giving somebody to spin board off to? Why is it a great post in your eyes? You know, what, it, what does it make you think of? What did you read about that this reminds you of? Um, sometimes if there's a personal experience, again, depending on the context, depending on the class, that can help flesh out why you feel the way you feel. You know, that's a great, a great point. I like this post is a good place to start, but it can't be where your discussion ends. You know, the more substantive your responses can be, the more you're going to be showing your teacher and your classmates that you know what you're talking about. And that, again, that you've, you're demonstrating your mastery of the material, that you've, you've read this stuff, you've thought about it, you've digested it, and now you are able to turn it back around and put it back out into the world with your own spin on it. You know, and that's just as important in your discussion responses as it is in your initial discussion posts. And some of that is wrapped up in this last bullet point as well. Try to respond to those whose responses are the most meaningful to you. Often, especially early in the program, you're going to have classes with 19 other people, 20 other people, and you're not going to click with all of them, and that's okay. You don't want to end up having to respond to somebody who essentially who, who isn't engaging to you, who doesn't, you know, who, whose points are not something to click with you. Find somebody who you feel like you have something to say to. And honestly, the best way you can do that is getting on the discussions early. Often, your, discuss, your first discussion posts are going to be due by Wednesday, and you're going to have a certain number of responses due by Sunday, and you need to show that you've logged in four days a week. You know, that, that's, that's pretty typical. But if you wait until Wednesday to make your first your, your initial discussion board post, you are very likely not going to be the first person to get on that discussion board. And you may find that people took all the good things to say. <laughs> and if you want to respond to somebody waiting until Sunday or even waiting until Friday to get in those first discussion board posts, sometimes that's a difference between getting to talk about a really cool, interesting point and ending up just parroting back something somebody else already said. You know, getting there first, it, it matters. Maybe it shouldn't, but it does. Any questions on discussions or anything that I had uh, that I've spoken about? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Please. Hi, hi, Mr. Allen. OK, Hello. when you say you hide, when you say you cannot um, say I say mm -hmm. I responded and uh, how do you not to personalize? So how do you? How do you write during discussion? Because that is one of our in my grad studies right now for the past week already. Mm. So because I use my own personal plus my reading. So how do you respond to something um, if you don't if I should avoid using I? So in my opinion, Based, do I say based on what I read or on this topic written by so and so? Is that how you have? I have to respond back the way you you explained in this uh, discussion. Like you know, I, I think that definitely is one way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that if you are, if you use more of a a passive tone, and you know. Mm. A passive tone. Because, I, you know, and I, I'm going to apologize here. Because of those technical issues we had, I had some things I thought I was going to be able to prepare, and I didn't actually get the opportunity to. So I am, I am shooting from the hip here, which I just told you not to do. But <laughs> in your discussion posts, um, I can be fine. Again, it really depends on what your professor wants and what you know what the context of your discussions are. But often, I think it is possible to say, you know, instead of I think that Brown makes a good point on page 96 when he says yada, yada, yada. That can just as easily be Brown makes a good point on page 96 when he says yada, yada, yada. Simply by removing, I think okay. you're giving the same context, but you're not injecting. And it sounds like a small thing, but simply removing, I think it actually makes you sound more authoritative. It makes you sound like 
you know, it makes it sound like this is a fact. This isn't something that's up for debate. This is a good point. It right. actually changes the, the the impact of the sentence. And often when you're using, I think, I believe, you are softening the impact of your sentences because you're kind of making it, well, I think, but who the heck am I, is sort of the implication, or it can be the implication on those kinds of statements. So if you're able to state something more matter of fact, if you're able to say something without using that word, just sort of changing the wording around, you'll okay. find that often you speak more authoritatively and with more impact. Does and that make sense? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand because I have to get into the discussion after we talk about you talk because I have to post my discussion with our assignments. Like my assignment is to find two companies about their mission and vision and then discuss why do you think this one is good or bad? Okay, so what my project is now because I have experienced like I have an encounter personal experience with Steve Jobs. And then based on the first encounter, this is what it was his mission. And then now this is because now he's gone, they have this posting that is that okay? I think that that can be okay. And then um, the same with Tesla because I, I was there and I mm -hmm. watched Tesla from the original founder in 2003, how happened and I even talked to them and then now 2008, during the big recession between 2008 and 2011, Elon, Ma Elon Musk came in and he came up with good idea. And now he's becoming more world global. What now? And now he he's opening his German Tesla manufacturing company. So that's that's what I'm saying. I, I don't want to I want to avoid the word I, but. That's why I have to be cautious. I want to speak like what you just told me hmm. with academic and then what I read and also from experience. Is that OK or no? Well, I think if you are, <laughs> I know, and I, I, I realize I realize what I'm saying, but I yes. um, depending on exactly what the, the instructors are looking for, if you are simply comparing again, comparing the mission statement, comparing, you know, those things. Right. Your own personal experience can be fine, but unless it's set, stated specifically otherwise, it can't be the only thing because, right. you know, one individual's experience doesn't mean that that is the way that this kind of thing always works. You know, it's I, I don't right. eat hot dogs because I had a hot dog once and there was, you know, and somebody, <laughs> yeah. you know, somebody stuck a pickle in it and that was just the worst thing ever. It doesn't mean that all hot dogs are bad. It doesn't mean that that's the way all hot dogs come. That means that was your experience with a hot dog. The vast majority of hot dogs do not have pickles in them. So the, you know, an opinion or a personal anecdote can lend a lot of weight to things, but you want to make sure that you've got facts that supplement that right. as well. Understood. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, of course. Yes, sir. Know, and what you may even want to do in your class Post it the way that you think you should post it, you know, post it with those personal experiences, but maybe follow up with the instructor after the fact, send him an email on the side and say, hey, you know, I did this because these were my personal experience. I knew, I knew Steve Jobs. I, you know, I knew Tesla back in the day. Yeah. This is why I wrote this way. Is that okay with you? Okay. You know, because there is also every instructor's got their quirks. Every instructor has the pieces of this thing that matter the most to them. Okay. And often finding out what they want from you because they are going to be the people that are giving you grades and <laughs> if that's going to be it, it that's it's the honest truth of it you know it's i it, we're they're not machines they're people and understood understanding what they want can matter a lot but yeah, yeah. that's i don't leave it just at the personal experience look for something else that's going to help back that up and make sure you've okay. got the facts on your side okay thank you absolutely um, other questions on discussion board posts? <laughs> OK. All right. And again, I'll have one more question and answer session at the end of this as well. Um, oh, and actually, we're coming up against time. I apologize because we started so late. So I am going to start to move through this a little bit faster to try and be respectful of y'all. Um, if people need to drop out, I certainly understand. But uh, I'm going to plow forward here and try and get to the end of this. So how to post an assignment. This is another one. You're going right. to get really used to this. Really, okay. really used to it. Um, your assignments 
are going to be posted in that that left hand stripe that has the unit one two three four five six seven eight. In each of those assignments, you've, you've I'm sure you already know those pages are broken up into sections. They're going to you're going to find one that says, for example, unit three assignment trends and reports part two or four. Now, the words unit three assignment trends and reports part two or four. That is a, that is a link. So if you click on that link, that word unit three assignment trends and trends report part two of four it is going to bring you to your submission page. Oh, OK. All right, it's going to give you a due date. It's going to give you how many points it is and an option usually to view the rubric. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, you can see exactly how the grading is going to break down. OK. Below that same page right below that is the place where you can actually submit your assignment. All right, you can browse local files. It's going to go right to your computer. You can pick, you can select where the assignment is and attach it. And again, you just follow the instructions. So that's that part is very simple, but you browse local files as your computer. There's a text box below to add comments. Is there anything that you want to say to the professor about the assignment? Um, hey, I really love this assignment or hey, I really I, I thought this was really interesting, but I didn't understand what this part was. Help. I don't want to say, my stuff is going in. Sorry, I'm in the. Yeah. Oh, no, I no, no, you're fine. I will mute. You're, you're fine. Um, but adding the comments down there again, anything you want them to know about this assignment or about the paper you're submitting, you can put in add comments. Uh, I have absolutely had students who took the text of their assignment and copy and pasted it into that comment box. So I just got, you know, eight pages of text. Um, that um, is not the correct way to do this. Okay. <laughs> If you're having trouble submitting, maybe submit it that way, but follow it up with an email to the professor where you attach your Word document or whatever your, you know, or your PowerPoint presentation, whatever that is. Don't just type the text in that text box. Right. Because any kind of formatting you put in there, any kind of any kind of paragraph structure, any kind of anything is all going to get lost. Um, mm -hmm. That is not what they're looking for. You always want to use the attach file to make sure they are getting the file from you okay. Okay. the way that you want it to be seen. All right. And then at the bottom, there's the submit button in purple and submit. We'll send everything away until you hit submit. They have not received anything yet, so you just want to make sure that you send that away. Okay. Now a couple things about posting assignments. First, double check the assignment information before posting. Make sure you're not missing anything. Again, you can use the rubric to see that also back on that page that you where you initially clicked from that says you know unit three there's an assignment description there's usually an attached pdf file that kind of goes over what the assignment should contain once you're done take a look at it a second time make sure that what you wrote matches what they're looking for um, triple check before submitting to make sure you're submitting the proper assignment uh, this is all too common that somebody has you especially if we don't have a lot of people at the grad level who take two classes at a time, but certainly students who are taking multiple classes submit the wrong thing for the wrong class. And um, you don't want to have to have that conversation with your professor. Often it's not the end of the world necessarily, but just double check it. Just really make sure that you know what you're sending in. Um, some weeks are going to have multiple assignments due, and certainly at the grad level that's, that can be very true. Um, and assignments can be quizzes or can, can be brought through discussion boards. There are a couple of different ways assignments might get submitted depending on your class, depending on your instructor, depending on the format of the course. Um, if you're ever unsure about how you're supposed to send something in, talk to your professor. Uh, let them know. You know, it's one of the best things you can do for yourself is to look over everything on Monday. You know, even if you're not posting on the discussion board yet or diving into the chapters, go through everything that's due for the week on Monday, and that way you can ask your questions early and so you don't wind up scrambling on a Sunday. Right. Any questions on posting assignments? None, none so far. We'll see. I get mine due on Sunday. <laughs> all right. I have and, you been know, reading all night long. <laughs> well, Four I was, times. I'm just like, oh my God, why am I spending so much time in this? First assignment, I want to make sure it's perfect what you know what she wants me to to write about. 
and has to be minimum two pages. So we'll see. I got three more days to go. Very good. That is, that is not a bad thing. It sounds like you're doing what you got to do. And if you do run into trouble, we've got people here in the graduate office, you know, Thursday and Friday. We're here until Thursday. We have someone here till seven Friday. We're here till five Saturday and Sunday. We have people here, I think, until three Eastern time. Okay. So um, even if your specific advisor like myself is not in the office, people will be, you know, other graduate advisors who may still be able to help you out if you're okay. uh, if you find yourself with questions. All right. Thank you. Hey, the last thing that I wanted to talk about tonight is APA. Oh, okay. Um, and this is a lot. It's a, it's heavy for eight o'clock on a on a Wednesday, but and I'm not going to go into all of it. It's very easy to go down rabbit trails with APA, and I don't want to do that. There's some great stuff out there. The university offers great stuff. You know, there are some uh, some handouts that you can be provided with. You talk to the people in the Center for the Academic Success or tutor me or again the APA is global. So you could this is another place where you can go to YouTube or you can go to. Uh, you know, you can go to Google and find out good information on APA. Um, everything that's pulled here is from the Purdue OWL. Uh, it's the Purdue Online Writing Lab, the OWL and the OWL is kind of the gold standard for APA. Everything you ever need to know. If it comes from the Purdue Owl, it is correct. Uh, that is really that is where everybody checks their references off of, and it will not be the last time you hear about the Purdue Owl. So, a title page done in APA. I should also mention for the first time in years, APA has updated their format. Uh, this happened, I think, last year or maybe the fall previous to that. Uh, it was it's been APA sixth edition forever. Within the last year or two, it is now updated to APA 7th edition, and they made a couple of changes. So if you're familiar with APA in the past, but it's been a while, some of this might look slightly different, and it's because of that update. Again, very unusual. APA does not update often. We are just living, we're living in unprecedented times with new APA style. So first and foremost, the top of the page is a header. Again, up here says branching paths, a novel teacher evaluation model for faculty development. All right. This is, it used to be there it needed to be a running head at the top. No longer needs to be the case. All right, you just simply have the title at the top of your page. Your instructor may ask for a running head or a last name before a page number, something like that. Um, you do not need to list things that way. Uh, again, that is a, that, that's an old style APA and uh, let us know if there's something like that that comes up, but you should just be able to put your title at the top. Question. Yes. Um, and this is on the top, like two inches or two two inches above. See my my cover page or my assignment. I put it in the middle, so I had to use this way that there, I don't have to centralize it because a cover page is one page, right? And these are the only information. So I have to follow exactly this way? Yes, yeah, APA is, is okay. very specific as to what it needs. Okay. Um, so you can follow exactly what this <laughs> looks like and you will be correct. I will modify it again. <laughs> oh my God. All right, but yeah, the title should be centered, bold, written, you know, written exactly as I said, three or four lines below the top margin of the page. Uh, in this example, it is four line, four blank lines are above the title. Four lines above the yeah. title. Um, authors' names are written below the title. One double space blank line between them. Names should be first name, middle initial, last name. Again, as it's shown here. Um, any affiliation they need to know. These are from the Department of English, Purdue University. Below that is the class name. The instructor's name and the date, the due date of the assignment, that is. And how about the font and the the size? Do I use Times Roman and size twelve? That is fine. Okay. That is fine. Yeah. Anything, yeah, Times New Roman, Calibri, I think is another one that is acceptable. Arial, I think, is acceptable. I believe it's just those three. Um but yeah, Times in Roman is absolutely fine. Okay, first initial and last. Okay. 
All right. And I'm also I'm happy to send this presentation to anybody who wants it. So that would uh, be I, yeah, that's just contact me afterwards and I am more than happy to do that. Okay, um, thank you. Sure. All right. Okay. So there doesn't need to be any kind of introduction header. Again, the paper title just bolded and centered above the first body paragraph. Every paragraph should start with an indent. In the age of the internet, not everybody does this, but it is something that every paper should have. Okay. In this first paragraph as well, oh. they have done they they've pulled a quote from one of their sources. According to Thal, 2017, comma, quote, faculty evaluation and development cannot be considered separately. Evaluation without development is punitive and development without evaluation is guesswork. End quote, and a page number. Whenever you're putting a direct quote in your paper, yeah, they need to have citations. Both, it should have the author's name, it should have the year that the source was published. And again, in direct quotes like this, a page number of exactly where that quote came from. If you look a few lines down, you'll see a different way to do this. You'll see Lewis 1996. That can go after the quote as well. If you didn't have a way to work in the author ahead of time, it can go afterwards. Lewis 1996 as that one does. No. This it's, kind of go ahead. Um, yeah. Um so when you put the date, like I say, according to Phil, 2017. Mm -hmm. So at the end, when you do the work site they say cited, mm -hmm. I have to do the same thing for references again that would add up to the the number of pages. Ouch. Okay. Correct. Yeah, when you're doing it, <laughs> when you have an in-text citation, what that what that kind of that that small thing does, author, year, page number, that is yeah. letting the reader know that this comes from another source. I've got more information for you later. So anything that you cite within your paper, it needs to have an, okay. an, a, uh, a an entry in the reference page. So okay. that way, if they want to find out where do I find Thal. Or where do I find Lewis? They know they can go to that reference page and find out more. Okay. Ooh. Um, some of this, some of this, I'm going to blow. I'm going to pass by a little bit because it's uh, less important right at this moment. But, okay. um, but yeah. So in text citations, you want to make sure that you've got that information. It's also true with paraphrases. Again, the next sentence from the, at the top there, as the practices that constitute modern programmatic faculty development have evolved from their humble beginnings yeah. to become commonplace feature of university life. Lewis, 1996. Now, there's no quote on that, but that is something that that is a that is a thought that the author took from Lewis. And even though it is not a direct quote, you want to make sure that you are giving proper credit to. I didn't come up with that. Lewis came up with that. I okay. turned it around a little bit, but that is not my original thought. You know, even if it doesn't come directly from you, if, uh, even if it's not taking the author's exact words, even if it's a paraphrase or a summary, you want to make sure you're still giving that credit because okay. it is someone else's idea. Uh-huh. At the end of your paper <laughs> okay. is the reference page. Okay. And again, there's a lot of documents out here that can help with this. Um, a reference page at the top should just say references or reference. And two things to note here is number one, all these references are in alphabetical order by the last name of the primary author. Alphabetical? Yep. Okay. It starts with Ambedi, then goes to American, American Association of University Professors. Then to Anderson, then Armstrong, then Atea. They also all use what's called a hanging indent. If you notice, the first line starts up against the margin, but every additional line 
of that entry is tabbed over. There's there is space. So that way you can clearly see where one reference starts or what, where one reference ends and the next one begins. OK, and that's actually a setting you can find on Microsoft Word. You can you can see how to make a hanging indent. Um, or you can just hit the space bar a bunch of times, but that gets messy very, very quickly. OK. So Ooh, I still have work to do. <laughs> I am wrapping up, I promise. I promise. No, no, I'm just no, I'm talking about my first assignment. I need to polish it and, re, you know, just minor things. It's OK. Gotcha. But OK, so if you notice, even though all of these are kind of different, the yeah. format on all of them is the same. Okay. All right, it's got that last name, first initial of individual people. In if the it's, year. Uh, and then followed by the year. Then it has the title of the article. OK. Followed by the title of the journal in italics. Yeah, the journal. OK, it's italics. OK. Then, then any relevant page numbers, if it's something that's from a journal, from a larger work, and then a website where you can find it. And okay. these days, most of the things you're going to be referencing have websites. You know, there are there right. are definitely there are other formats for things that don't have websites, but for the most part, everything okay. you're going to have does have a website. So this format is repeated everywhere up and down this page. Um, the second one, if you notice, doesn't have a date, so there is N D listed in parentheses there because there is no date listed in that journal. Right below it, the second university professors one gives more than a date. It actually gives a day. <coughs> that journal gets very specific on when it was printed, so you give the whole thing. You give as much as they give you. <coughs> and there are a lot of different ways for to give references, a lot of different ways to cite them, depending on if it's coming from from a book, from a journal from from a website from a from a podcast or from you know uh, from an audio interview they all have different ways of doing this but as i mentioned the purdue owl if you're ever unsure <coughs> can get you the right information also academic writer remember that in in every class down that left hand side there's an APA <coughs> and that'll take you to all the information that you need on apa you can cite you can search through to find exactly how apa wants you to cite your source. There's also some good software out there that can put things in APA. I personally don't love the software. I, I I'm a big fan of do it manually, do it enough times and eventually you understand it. But there is some software out there that will format things for you. Uh, if you look around, you can find a couple of good ones. Um, and that is. That is my my quick and dirty treat this on APA. Okay. Again, it's a lot of information and there's not a silver bullet. There is no fun mnemonic device. I don't have any. I, I can't teach you a song that's good that you'll remember how to do APA. A lot of it comes from just doing it and doing it and doing it. Yeah. And um, you know, the <laughs> what I can promise you is that you will get there. It is something that you will eventually come to understand and you'll understand it so well that you'll know when something looks wrong. And that's how you know you've gotten good at this. If you can see it and go, something's wrong. Even if you don't know what, you know that doesn't look quite right. That means you're getting there. That means you've okay. got this. And uh, so that is the end of my presentation. I'm sorry this went over time. I'm sorry that we started late, but I appreciate everyone who was able to stick with me. Uh, any questions? Anything that I about anything that I went over tonight? Um, I'm happy. Thank you. Got lots of work to do, right? <laughs> I got to dig in. <laughs> oh my goodness. So thank you. This is very, very educational and thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. Anybody else with questions or anything else? <laughs> okay. Meeting well, adjourned. A meeting adjourned. If you do want to talk with me about anything or you would like a copy of the presentation, my name is Alan Kingsley. I should have written this out. Actually, I'll put it in the chat. You can find me at A Kingsley 
at post.edu. And I will be more than happy to send this to you or answer any other questions you have. Or if I can't answer them, I'll get you to the people who can. So can you, sir, can you please send me this one, especially, especially the discussion and the APA writing? That would be wonderful. To my email. Send me a quick email to remind me and I will get yes, it done. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, well, right now. Okay. All right. All right. Thank well, everybody, you. thank you so much for everything. And good night. Thank you. God bless you, sir. You as well. Have a great evening, all. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.